Let's take a look at Prezi and see if there are any questions about this. So I've um, set up a platform, a Prezi platform for um, the Wednesday group, the group that meets in section on Wednesday. The idea is that uh, your <coughs> Uh, the name of this one in your uploaded in your folder is number eight, and it covers the two topics from Friday and today: developmentalism and the Cold War. Let me fix the lights. Any questions so far? So for the group, Wednesday group, you cover you choose something to look at that helps us understand some aspect of those of something that happens within the realm of those two topics that falls within those two topics of developmentalism the lecture on on last Wednesday and the Cold War the lecture of today and then uh, okay and then on for the Friday group you will be looking at something chosen for its capacity to help us understand something about the issues from today's lecture and Wednesday's lecture. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, is this going to work? So I have um, your TAs and I have worked out um, a few things. Here's some advice that you may have noticed uh, of the steps to go through. Are there any questions about any of that? Yes? Is it more important to have 120 words or 60 seconds? Because 120 doesn't seem like enough to fill 60 seconds. Oh, you're a great testimony. <laughs> um, up to you. Somewhere, if it's, it, it can't be more than 60 seconds. Although I don't want to encourage fast talking, because I'm a little slow. Yeah, I think it's good to talk slowly, because sometimes it's hard to follow the argument because you're just listening to it for the first time. Yes. So trying to pace yourself, which yeah, I'm going to try to do as well. Slow for me is 140 words. Okay. OK. You get 140. <laughs> but aspire to 120. Try to say more with less. I know it's harder to write more succinctly. Other questions on this? This is, uh, I know this is all new to everyone and it's tough. Um, here are some guidelines uh, of what you might be looking for in the visual analysis and in my experience this is the hardest thing. What do you pull out of the, the image uh, that can tell us something? And this is the hardest thing for everyone, including your instructors, uh, historians in general. And sometimes historians just skip this part. Architectural historians just say, oh, it's just so much easier to look at the historical record of documents. Uh, so we miss the opportunity too often to dig into uh, meanings and relationships embedded in the physical environment itself. And that's one of the central theses of this course is that the power of architecture lies in the relationships that are established in its formal spatial arrangements and we're going to I keep coming back to that term it's somehow more specific than architecture formal spatial arrangements is where the rubber hits the road sometimes literally so here's a new thing how will you be evaluated your TAs uh, uh, will be looking at these five specific aspects, and it's worth considering it as you develop your uh, response to the assignment, how well you um, handle each of these five tasks. And um, you can ask, I'll give you a chance to read it, um, talk, to, talk to your TAs about it, uh, and bring it up on Wednesday if you have further questions, and so... That's up there on the Prezi. Um, I will make it available to everyone um, soon. Uh, it's, right now, I believe it's available 
to the Wednesday section. And um, uh, Dariel, if you can go in and see if you can make sure everyone has access. You have editing rights. Actually, everyone does. But um, you should be able to extend access to people. And then we have, as usual, our four um, polls. Uh, these are intentionally uh, polemical extremes. On the horizontal axis is the, um, the Cold War issues that uh, have in common between the Wednesday and the Friday group. On the vertical axis for the Wednesday group, it will be the issue of developmentalism. And um, for the Friday group, it will be the issue whatever the next thing we're talking about on Wednesday. I have no idea what we're talking about. Um, so on the, uh, here we go, the two poles on the uh, Cold War axis, the formal spatial arrangements reinforce and reproduce state-approved ideals of social, political, economic relationships. Hint, if you have no idea what these words strung together mean, ask yourself continually uh, during the course of this lecture, what they might possibly are there any examples in this lecture uh, of of architecture operating in this manner? Then at the other extreme, formal spatial arrangements reinforce and reproduce the ideals of free market social, political, economic relationships. This one is harder. Why? Because it's invisible to us. Scientists have shown that fish don't have a word for water. They they don't even have the concept of water because, well, first of all, they're, they don't have language as far as we know. But even if they did have language, it would be very difficult for them to speak intelligently about water since they swim in it. They know nothing but water. This is why this one is very difficult for us. Um, we would have to live overseas for a while before we can come back and all of a sudden it becomes obvious. And this class, hopefully, uh, true to the ideals of the global modern um, theme is a mini version of living overseas and I hope you experience it that way. Uh, on the vertical axis for the Wednesday group, the formal spatial arrangements of automobility have become a central factor in the way societies manage the discrepancies between wealth and poverty. Let's see if this one... Uh, similarly, the formal spatial arrangements of transportation infrastructure in coordination with specific land uses have demonstrated a capacity for creating successful mixed income communities. The intention here is one uh, falls into the easy path of saying it's natural. These discrepancies between wealth and poverty uh, and the sorting that occurs spatially is quote unquote natural. And I try to avoid waving my hands in the air making these types of marks, but uh, when you come to the, the way the concept of nature and natural are used in today's world, we kind of have to uh, beware of what happens um, when we take those words for granted. And then on the upper one, we're looking for examples where they're deliberately taking control of the formal spatial arrangements in order to uh, intervene in what would otherwise be a very extreme sorting of social groups. So think of Los Angeles, what we talked about with those maps, gated communities uh, on this vertical axis. Um, OK, any questions about the Prezi? And when you put your, when you identify a place for you to locate your submission, beware that other people are going to be locating uh, on this field of responses according to what you say. And you should locate yourself according to the way other people have positioned them. If one of your colleagues has clearly um, needs to be moved, you have the authority uh, that you negotiate uh, on the internet to move their position into a more appropriate location. So your position may be relocated by one of your colleagues or by one of your TAs. Okay? So it's as you get the hang of this, it should become a dynamic field of engagement that continues to take form as the moment of truth uh, arrives and you sit down in the class with your colleagues. And during the discussion, as we move into the semester, hopefully um, 
you will all, especially your TAs, become very nimble at allowing new material to be uploaded during the discussion so that the discussion can develop further and you can make a point using evidence. And remember, we follow Missouri rules. You're not allowed to say anything unless you're showing it. So this is not an illustrated report. This is evidence that you then work with to develop meaning. So it's, it's a little bit backwards from the usual illustrative report. It's now the illustrations have taken control and they're driving the argument, uh, which is what we like to see in history as well as science. Any questions now? Okay. And so we will leave this screen and we find ourselves uh, talking about the Cold War. Now, the odd thing about this in an architectural history course is the traditional method of dealing with architectural history, if I'm allowed to caricature it a bit unfairly, is that the Cold War is a big historical force and it has nothing to do with architecture. Architecture is its own little thing. Well, another big thesis of the course is such separations may be useful, but their usefulness is conditional. It's useful to look at architecture in and of itself to really understand the architecture. And we've done that with Villa Savoie. We've done that with Roby House. We've done that with sev many of the uh, 16 or so uh, sites that we have examined. But it's not enough on its own anymore, given our current situation in the 21st century. So let's see what happens if we uh, start from the other side and say history is important. Architecture may or may not be important. So we ask the question, if the Cold War is a big historical force, is there any architecture that uh, helps us understand these big historical forces? Um, let's start with the presumption of yes and see what happens. Um, so the test is for me to only say things if I can show it to you. And uh, hopefully I've chosen the things to show you in ways that actually do shed light on these large historical forces. We're going to start with the evidence provided by Konstantin Melnikov's 1925 a Soviet pavilion at the Paris Exposition of that year. And I try to avoid Western European and North American sites, but um, what can you do? This is an example that allows us to get access to, I would claim, uh, the larger political forces driving the communist uh, international movement of the 20th century through the architectural aesthetic means uh, at its disposal that it took great advantage of. So from this position uh, of the last few decades that architecture doesn't do anything, it establishes meaning by reflecting back passively the values of our society, well, they didn't think so. And here's my evidence. Um, the experience of walking through this pavilion was highly charged, and it was charged by the spatial experience. Number three, that thing we love so much, is the exemplification of architecture, of what happens to us when we bodily move through space. Uh, it was intended to do so. It was intended to move us emotionally in the history, in the legacy of agitation propaganda or its uh, shortened version, agitprop, which was uh, a movement in the arts uh, of uh, Soviet uh, propaganda through the arts, largely through theater. Uh, but set designs were very much a part of this as well. So in the early sketches, he's trying to create this dynamic movement that will affect us emotionally. And uh, here's a photo of the outcome. Uh, of what it's like to move through this highly jarring space. The structure itself is very modest, um, cheaply built, thin materials that you can see uh, in the plan when we get to it. 
but it was set in Paris. On um, you can see it up here. I guess you can't see it because of the screen settings. On behalf of MIT, I apologize for the poor technical <coughs> execution. Uh, the inside of it, the actual contents, the function, the literal function of the building was to showcase the outpouring of workers' literature that uh, demonstrated uh, the capacity of workers to produce cultural artifacts of great worth. And uh, this union of uh, the proletarian struggle of the workplace and a larger cultural transformation that at this point, many people, both in the Soviet Union and in the United States and elsewhere in the West, truly believed in their hearts of hearts that this was the future, that it was inevitable that the entire world would be unified in this new movement, driven in part by the tremendous technological changes, but not just technology, also the political institutions of uh, expanding democracy and empowerment of the, the masses. And so this was uh, the content delivered in this package of architecture. Um, you can see in the plan that it was a, a simple set of spaces, thin construction, uh, but other than that, the plans don't really reveal that much. What about the axonometric? Remember, the axonometric is the ultimate viewpoint of architecture that gives us a more omniscient view. It's actually humanly impossible to experience things in plan, elevation, and axonometric. But there's an evening out of space that lifts us out of the human body and out of the physics of optical uh, and the physio physiology of optical experience, lifts us to a more omniscient viewpoint. So uh, in this case, it doesn't reveal that much, which tells us something. I, I, that's what I, you might differ in opinion. Uh, the section, also an impossible, uh, most of the time an impossible view of the architecture, but you can experience um, by projecting yourself into this, what it might be like to step up the stairs through the building and out again. The model, uh, another uh, favorite view for accessing architecture. Uh, if we had the model here on the table and we could move around it, it would probably tell us a great deal of what the experience is like. But by far, it seems the human perspectival view in this case is the one that starts to really work in terms of offering that dynam dynamism of spatial experience of moving through this, uh, almost as if this is a threshold, a portal through which uh, humanity will be passing uh, with a certain degree of inevitability. And so we have uh, photography, which was the ultimate uh, new art uh, form of the modern age, uh, to surpass and replace, ultimately, painting in, uh, in many people's views. Um, and so we see the, the use of the camera to capture these scenes that were not intentionally created, but are the natural outgrowth of the industrialization of society and the transformation of human work. Uh, and so you get this uh, fantastic view, which resonates very directly with the spatial experience of Melnikov's uh, pavilion. And so moving into how architecture, uh, this architecture tells us something about the larger uh, forces operating uh, at this time in the world. Um, we have to remember that in October and from starting in October of 1917, the Bolshevik revolution the storming of the Winter Palace shown here in St. Petersburg, Russia, and the overthrow of the corrupt czar, czarist family uh, concentration of power by the workers in, united with uh, the armed forces to a large extent. They started a period of civil war uh, that culminated in uh, the, uh, the seizing of power of a small cabal of, uh, of leaders representing the workers of uh, the society. And uh, they became the core group of the communist government of the young 
Union of Soviet Socialists Republic. And the artistic sense of uh, this resonated with this artistic sense of we must start over from scratch, tabula rasa. Everything goes away. Everything that we've known from the past is pushed aside. And we push aside the leaders, we push aside the governmental institutions, we push aside social hierarchies, and we start over from scratch, guided by the pure spirit of modernism, of what it means to be modern. And so one of uh, our favorite visions of this is Kazimir Malevich's rejection of all figural art and getting back to the very core, which he proposed here as the black square. And so he... He does multiple versions of this, culminating in his headstone uh, uh, at his grave, uh, a sculptural version of this painting. Um, but it quickly moves into compositions of pure abstract form that is very much uh, another way we could revisit the, uh, the emergence of uh, modern painting. Uh, and this resonates, of course, with what we saw in the de Stijl uh, work of Garrett Rittfeldt of uh, the last lecture. And from painting into uh, the painting becomes spatial, very literally. And the I'm rushing through a progression, uh, but it's inevitably reaching the realm of forms imprinting themselves on the urban landscape as an element capable of transforming society. And the, uh, the Art Institute uh, established by the young uh, uh, USSR uh, favored uh, the production of communist forms. What's a communist form? Even Lenin uh, had trouble with this, but he was willing to go along with it. Um, and uh, here we see Malevich's uh, own architecton studies of masses, not that different from the compositional uh, experimentation of both Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, his, the, his community of influence uh, in the European continent um, about this time. Um, and so Vladimir Lenin was snuck over the border into, um, during the revolution to arrive in Petrograd, he snuck over the border in an odd alliance um, to, uh, un to destabilize uh, the, so the Russian state, and it worked brilliantly. He was a young radical, um, snuck over the border in a, in a camouflaged rail car uh, in order to arrive in St. Petersburg and take, eventually take the helm as the central figure. And not just central figure in the way you would think of a normal politician, but his body becomes at the core of the revolution. And you see it in the art, the agitprop, the agitation propaganda art of the posters. Fantastic stuff if you're into the history of graphic arts. And it involves the body position of uh, Lenin and the, the body position of the workers. And so the body of the individual leader, the body of the individual worker, and the collective body of the workers are all leaning in unison in this upwardly mobile diagonal direction, uh, often to the left. Uh, or is that the right? I guess when you look, depending on how you're looking at it. It's hard when I'm standing up here. Um, and it becomes very much uh, at the core of the aesthetic vocabulary of graphic arts and then uh, architecture. And so the transition from the posters and graphic arts into the architecture, we'll see almost this as a direct quote when we look at the Bauhaus uh, of the architecture. But again, the raised hand and arm, the leaning forward of the body, it is not just a revolution uh, of politics, it is a revolution of the relationship between the human body and the world. And thus it gets expressed in the uh, architecture um, this is the, one of the clearest ones, one of my favorites. But it becomes uh, a central aspect of um, early constructivist uh, Soviet art in many of the things that actually get built. Also, uh, the, the use of, of uh, language imprinted on the facade uh, 
uh, is very much a part of the trajectory uh, that we're now seeing in reverse. We see it in Las Vegas with the architectural signage, um, and we saw it in the MIT buildings uh, in the very first site we looked at. And here's an example. <clears throat> but we also have uh, expressions of the technological, the new technologies of cranes and elevators um, and equipment that get directly and honestly expressed in the exterior expression of the building. And we even get to the point, talk about uh, a duck, uh, referring to Las Vegas. Here we see the hammer and sickle symbol um, translated directly into a plan view. Uh, here we see the equipment, the large pulley of the elevator. Uh, in the Veston Brothers Pravda building proposal, the use of text, uh, the explicit use of antennas and uh, broadcast equipment, a searchlight. This is to be a point of dissemination of the message of the communist movement. And it was an international message. Uh, and the, this diagonal motion gets expressed in Vladimir Tatlin's tower proposal, uh, where the bodies uh, of the of the legislative bodies are enclosed in these uh, abstract forms floating in the tower, again uh, embodying and uh, exemplifying, uh, again that word, the dynamic motion. Unfortunately for those of us who are thrilled by this kind of uh, architect, direct architectural expression of ideologies, um, it's quite interesting to see where it is directly related in the eyes of the people producing it. Uh, those of us who uh, are really mm. interested in this type of thing, um, unfortunately for us, in 1933, with the competition for the Palace of the Soviets, which we saw a competition entry uh, by Corbusier um, last week, uh, comes to a crashing halt when a conservative uh, wave comes into power in the body of Joseph Stalin. And the, uh, the experimentation, I should use the word, the new objectivity, that, uh, that uh, non-figural space, these abstract forms in space, is part of the abstraction and the idealization of large forces that are not based uh, ironically, uh, in the looking back at the history of the Soviet Union, not based on personality, not based on the single person, but the spirit of the workers, the spirit of humanity um, in its grand idealization. Here it comes to a crashing halt, and you get back, uh, snap back directly into uh, references to the traditions and history of the progress, the so-called progress of civilizations, so you're reconnected across that rupture that was at the core of the spirit of the Soviet um, aesthetic movement. And so we'll, we'll look at this, um, how this manifests further um, in the future. Um, but Boris Iofan's winning competition uh, for the Palace of the Soviets really uh, establishes very clearly this shift back to uh, traditional forms of architecture. So the uh, competition between the Soviet Union and the Western allies um, heats up uh, all the more so despite the alliance between these two worlds uh, to defeat Nazism and fascism in Italy uh, uh, and in the Pacific arena. Despite that successful alliance during World War II, things uh, are constantly during World War II threatening to fall apart and immediately upon the conclusion of World War II they do fall apart. Um, but we'll check into that later. What we see here is the the old city of Frankfurt, Germany um, prior to World War II uh, and we see it here represented in, in model form. Um, so the architects at work uh, venerating this historic city, and you can probably guess why uh, it was so important to venerate. It, um, it was uh, a Roman settlement, and you uh, will get back to the patterns of Roman settlements in Europe. Um, we'll look at lots of images like this. Um, 
The reason it's so important to venerate it is because it was lost. It was destroyed in the Allied bombing on Frankfurt uh, during World War II, um, saving, uh, mostly uh, sparing the uh, cathedral, uh, but totally devastating this part of town um, that had been such an important historic center. Uh, and so this uh, is our second site, and it is uh, the one chosen to uh, give us access to the large historical force of the Allied forces of the West after World War II uh, under the aegis of the Marshall Plan, a huge investment in war-torn areas to rebuild and reconstruct and uh, win over uh, the allegiance of these uh, nation states recovering from the traumas of World War II such that they can uh, uh, join the free world, so-called, on our side here in the United States of the Iron Curtain, which uh, came down uh, cutting Berlin in half into East and West Berlin and the country of Germany into East and West Germany. And so here in West Germany, uh, Frankfurt, the importance of Frankfurt made it a strong candidate for the new capital of Germany, given the uh, fragility of the Berlin situation uh, that, I'm sorry, we don't have time to go into the whole history of the, uh, the airlift that saved Berlin and the construction of the wall. But Frankfurt was uh, a favored location. The reason, ultimately, that Bonn was chosen over Frankfurt to be the capital of West Germany was the fear that uh, the effort to reunify East and West Germany would result in the capital of that new reunified Germany staying in Frankfurt, because Frankfurt was such an important city throughout history. Uh, and so they chose Bonn instead, in part, in order to uh, emphasize the temporary nature, the ephemeral nature of it as a capital, and the ephemeral nature of the East-West Division. It lasted a lot longer than um, many people thought or hoped. But here we are in 1963, a competition uh, for the uh, reconstruction of the destroyed portion of Frankfurt in multiple views. Um, here with uh, the entry of Candelis, Jossick, and Woods, uh, a firm that we know from the Unité d'Habitation uh, when they got their start in Corbusier's office and then went on uh, to work on some of the projects associated with Team 10, the, the alternative to the Siam high modernist movement of the 20th century. This is one of the, the purest examples of a matte building. It's their Free University of Berlin, the same time as the Romerberg competition for Frankfurt. And here they are saying, uh, in the tradition of the brutalist architects, that architecture is not just an object building. It is a permanent infrastructure, thus built in raw concrete or baton brut, and thus the term brutalism. It is an infrastructure, it is an armature, which then gets occupied by human activities in the spirit of the Previ housing project uh, and others that we've looked at in the past. Um, and by past, I mean the future, of course, because we're going backwards. Uh, and so this uh, building is the clearest example of how this multiple leveled infrastructure and a system of circulation and uh, both horizontally in each layer of the mat but also vertically as you see in the section here of ramps that, that gently bring us up and down, escalators. Uh, we're probably familiar with this more in the case of shopping malls but it's not that different from what we've ended up here at MIT so it should be quite uh, familiar. And so the mat building approach of the Free University of Berlin is applied here in Frankfurt for the competition. Um, uh, applying multiple layers of the mat building, fitting in between uh, the buildings that were spared and the new buildings that were being proposed. And so uh, a, a comparison between the old city that was lost and the new city that would uh, emerge from uh, the reconstruction in this competition. There's the circulation pattern um, and the multiple levels. And here you see the lower level where you see large footprint buildings 
uh, interspersed with smaller footprint buildings, and then you add the layers up through using this model, even uh, including uh, passage over the river. Um, what is that, the Rhine in Frankfurt? Oh, on Main. Yes. Okay. And and their their proposal is disqualified immediately by the jury because it doesn't follow the competition rules. Welcome to the club. Uh, and uh, this a, a young firm is given the task uh, of the reconstruction, but it is very controversial, and it's held up for uh, about a decade. And finally, uh, when they do get to the reconstruction, um, it is adapted uh, from this, which is largely um, uh, replacing the, the historic fabric with um, a contemporary expression. We get to uh, a new approach um, that increasingly favors the replication of historic buildings on top of a hollow platform under which modern infrastructure uh, can be injected. So in a way, it's a hybrid uh, that appears uh, to some of us to have been very influenced by uh, the mat building proposal of Candelis, Jossick, and Woods. And so we see this juxtaposition of replications of historic fabric reproduced from uh, photographic evidence uh, pre-war to this uh, starkly contemporary brutalist um, uh, concrete open framework. And here you see the edge. I could not find a good section cut that showed the relationship between the plinth and the uh, falsely historicized uh, surface, uh, almost like Disneyland, which is built on a hollow earth uh, system where the trash cans can be uh, emptied from below. Uh, it's that kind of a um, situation here, um, but a highly, uh, it's interesting, they have recently demolished this, uh, town, this uh, town hall uh, and are now building something new. But uh, here are the Roman ruins that are discovered during uh, the process. And so we have multiple moments in history uh, represented in the outcome of this project. Uh, something that uh, becomes important when we look at Berlin and what happened in Berlin, and in Dresden um, later. And so here we see um, some, the demolition of the, of the new building. And now it's worth looking at uh, the reproduction. This lecture has inadvertently had to deal with uh, attitudes towards history in the production of architecture. Um, uh, because the evidence uh, forces that. Um, we look at the photographic evidence of the pre-war buildings and uh, on this reproduced Romerberg Plaza, uh, the reproductions of the buildings that were lost uh, with a high degree of fidelity uh, between the old and the new. Old and new. Uh, and then interspersed in there are some buildings that uh, take an unapologetically uh, contemporary approach as well um, in the postmodern uh, genre, um, but I'm not going to look at those. Dresden uh, is a similar situation. The firebombing of Dresden um, uncovers uh, some of the pre, um, the earlier Roman ruins, uh, and then the challenge of reconstructing Dresden uh, faces them with similar challenges. Here's a clear example of contemporary architecture done uh, in an historicized manner, something that Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown would highly approve of uh, at the time. Here's something that's more um, unabashedly contemporary, yet true in spirit, um, the, the blood that was spilled uh, on the night of the firebombing of Dresden is commemorated here in the mortar joints of the paving patterns. Um, which brings us uh, to the next chapter of this story of the Cold War, the uh, competition between the US uh, with its Marshall Plan, uh, enticing uh, nations to participate in the open market approach, uh, at least um, ostensibly open market approach, uh, aspiring towards an open market approach, 
uh, although there's a lot of um, barriers to that. Uh, you can open up, apparently you can open up markets as long as you've guaranteed the position of powerful players to dominate those so-called open markets. And so it's a, uh, this would be the place where uh, if we were a more purely historical course, we would talk about the difference between capitalism with a small c in its idealistic forms and capitalism with a capital C and maybe even a trademark at the end. Uh, the things that are uh, promoted and packaged under the, the label of capitalism uh, being two very different things. Uh, and so here we see in the Aswan Dam some of the operations of this uh, on both sides of the Cold War competition. Um, Egypt uh, was a staunch supporter of the non-aligned movement and uh, after the revolution in 1952 uh, that put Gamal uh, Abdul Nasser uh, at the head of the new nation state, the newly um, the newly uh, democratically uh, fierce uh, supporter of, of democracy in um, this part of the world, uh, established itself uh, as a leader of the Arab world uh, and adamantly opposed to becoming a, um, a state under the power of either superpower. Uh, so it avoided being dominated by the Soviet Union uh, and the United States. Uh, or it aspired to avoid being dominated. Um, and in the process, very deftly, was able to play one off the other to great benefits of the people of Egypt. Uh, and one of the great benefits of this superpower competition playing out in nation states all over the world, uh, here's a great example of how uh, crafty, young, intelligent, nimble leaders can actually um, deliver the goods. And in this case, the Aswan Dam, something that had been talked about during British colonial rule of Egypt, uh, and they actually built the low dam uh, on the Nile River to control the seasonal flooding that you'll see as we go back in history was the basis of a one of the longest standing uh, civilizations in human history. Uh, that relatively stable flooding pattern of the Nile was the basis of great agricultural wealth, but not up to contemporary standards. Uh, there was still an awful lot of time lost um, during the flooding and an awful lot of land that could not be used for human settlement. And so the, the inevitability of these dam projects in multiple places, um, up to and including the Three Gorges Dam of um, of China today. Um, and so we see the dam itself uh, as architecture, uh, or it's something that allows itself, uh, makes itself available to architectural, architectural examination. Um, there's some question. Um, it's so huge uh, that it's difficult to grasp. It's not designed as an experience, the exception being um, the monument to Arab Soviet friendship. It's located over here. Um, but as a piece of construction that manifests very large historical forces, it works brilliantly. Um, and uh, as mentioned, the forces of the Nile River have dominated this part of the world uh, of the Sudan, uh, contemporary Sudan and, um, and Egypt, uh, and the trade system of the world when the Suez Canal was built uh, is very much a part of this history as well that we're not going to go into uh, today. But the dam itself is this vast production and it releases the huge human potential of the population of Egypt, one of the most dynamic uh, nation states of Africa, um, by supplying electricity to half the nation and uh, creating uh, irrigation supply, a stable irrigation supply to ex greatly expand the agricultural output um, through this system of, uh, of canals and docks and uh, the old dam, which partially uh, created a lake behind it upstream to the south, and then the high dam, which created Lake Nasser, named after uh, the first uh, post-colonial leader, uh, post-royal leader. Um, of the construction, 
Um, an interesting thing happened during negotiations um, between uh, uh, Nasser and the United States. Um, the invasion of Israel um, uh, the, the in 1955 revealed the weakness of any possible Arab response to, uh, to activities uh, on their borders and actually crossed into Egyptian territory, thus quickly shifting the fo Nasser's focus to, from uh, agricultural uh, reform and land reform to defense. And so Nasser asked uh, as, a, as a condition uh, uh, to agreeing to the Marshall Plan uh, funding for the Aswan Dam to uh, arms, uh, to an arms deal. He wanted uh, to arm his, uh, his country to defend itself from uh, external aggression. And uh, the terms that the U.S. offered were that the arms were to be used for defensive purposes only, and only then under the guidance of U.S. advisors, which would, uh, as we have seen in the history since then, uh, very clearly um, uh, reduce the status of Egypt to a vassal state of uh, the West. Uh, he rejected those terms and threatened to uh, accept uh, the Soviet offer of uh, arming arms uh, from Czechoslovakia uh, with no strings attached. And um, the U.S. took a gamble, lost that gamble, and in many people's eyes lost Egypt to uh, the, the Soviets. Um, but uh, there was still hope. And the interesting thing that happened, and we've, it's been repeated in history since, that with the loss of Egypt uh, to the Soviet uh, fold, uh, actually increased the attention and offers of aid that the U.S. was willing to give. And um, that's one of the more interesting aspects attached to this construction um, that occurs from 1960 aggressively to 1970. Um, it results in this massive earthwork dam. Um, so there's no dramatic Hoover Dam. Uh, there's less of a dramatic Hoover Dam wall of concrete. It's more of an earthworks. Uh, production, uh, but it includes this monument to Arab-Soviet friendship uh, with its um, uh, ring of friendship, uh, and here the, the denotation imprinted on the face of the monument uh, in both um, uh, Russian and Arabic, uh, celebrating this friendship uh, and uh, risking the ire of uh, the Allied forces. Um, the, As the low Aswan Dam, um, the earlier work by the British, um, shown here at the end of World War, um, World War II, the alliance, the moment of, uh, that I referred to earlier, of alliance between uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, and uh, here we see Joseph Stalin um, of the, the Soviet Union. Uh, that alliance quickly fell apart um, at this time, and you get this uh, this quick uh, absorption uh, of uh, with Russia as, as the cultural uh, centerpiece of the Soviet Union, but quickly absorbing multiple states on the uh, red side of the Iron Curtain in this depiction of um, this. As maps often do, they uh, contain the rhetorical message of mobilizing action uh, to face this threat of Soviet expansion. And here we see um, the alliances and the jockeying for position. Uh, Egypt is off the map, but um, over the years, there's uh, a, a shifting of the line. Uh, you see Berlin as this island uh, deep in uh, East Germany. Um, that was cut off from the West during the airlift. And here you see the Berlin Wall uh, in the 60s um, at the height of the Cold War, uh, separating, uh, cutting through the center of Berlin, separating East from West. Um, the non-aligned movement uh, here uh, launched with great flourish in Bandung, Java, uh, after the Dutch colonial, uh, uh, the defeat of the Dutch colonial powers. 
uh, and became the independent nation state of Indonesia, which is a very bizarre collection of over 400 distinct sub-nations, uh, but really holding together the, the, uh, colonial, uh, the colonial gains of the Dutch, uh, holding it together uh, barely uh, under the Javanese rule. Uh, but in 1955, the first president of Indonesia, who was uh, uh, a, one of the first graduates of the um, modern architecture program in Bandung, uh, hosted the Non-Aligned Movement Conference in 1955. We're coming up, we're a few weeks away from the, uh, the 60th anniversary of this event, um, where you see Jawaharlal uh, Nehru speaking with Nasser, uh, and Joanne Lai from China, and leaders from all over Africa. And the commitment was, we are not going to uh, align ourselves with either of the superpowers. We are a third path, and we represent humanity. Uh, unlike the superpowers, we are a majority of the, the world. Uh, at that point, um, the, uh, what we called the first and second world constituted a little bit less than a billion people. If we think back to the first lecture and we saw the population explosion, uh, around the end of World War II, it was, uh, uh, the global population was about two billion, and uh, a little less than one billion was in what we called the first and second world, and a little bit more than a billion was in what we called the third world. This was the birth of that third world, the first world being uh, the Western allies, uh, the second world being the communist uh, world, and the third world being uh, the developing, what we called after that, the developing world, but the non-aligned, uh, recently independent nation states coming out of colonialism. Um, and so Nasser, uh, playing the two sides against the other, was very successful at getting arms and a dam. Uh, and we go from the Nile River, which you already see expanded because of the lower dam uh, of the British construction, and then expanding because of the higher dam. And you can see it off to your left on this image, uh, the low dam and the high dam, um, and the larger reservoir of Nasser Lake. The question, much of this passes into Sudan. Um, the question of evaporation uh, it was better to go further south and put um, the dam upriver, but they didn't want so much of the water to end up in Sudan, so they put it in a, le a technically less favorable location downriver. Um, it's technically less favorable because of the greater evaporation that occurs further north in Egypt. Um, and now, so what's the U.S. response? Oh, we've it appears that we've lost Egypt. Uh, and so the U.S. response is to focus in hard and heavy on the cultural legacy of Egypt. And um, so the, the, um, the great monuments of Egyptian civilization, uh, some of which are prone to flooding even before uh, the High Aswan Dam, uh, are now, some of them, uh, directly put underwater uh, permanently. And so there is a rapid mobilization of funding for archaeology uh, to discover, explore sites, and choose some sites to uh, save. And, um, and we'll get into what we mean by save. Um, but the, the vast majority of the funding comes from the United States. Um, a graduate of this program, Lucia Alais, uh, has published a very interesting examination of this chapter in the Aswan Dam's history. Um, the Soviet Union also uh, uh, makes donations as well, um, but the U.S. takes the lead and encourages other members of the West, um, Brotherhood of Nations, to support the preservation of the heritage. And in a bold move, they decide to slice up uh, the Abu Simbel uh, monument into blocks, uh, 20 to 30 ton blocks that can then be lifted by cranes and reassembled on a higher location. And um, the archaeological finds uh, up and down uh, the Nile uh, 
are all uh, divided and, and taken on by sponsorship of different nations. So this is really a conclave of international proportions uh, playing out through the proxies of archaeological sites. And there is a, a transition from a, a institutional regime of 50-50 splitting of the archaeological spoils, where the sponsoring nation gets half of it, and Egypt gets the other half, uh, which is replaced. Uh, it's very uh, interesting to follow the negotiations that occur. Uh, it's replaced with negotiations where there is a judgment uh, of these archaeological findings as either being... Uh, part of the nation-state Egypt, of the Egyptian identity, or not. And if it supplies part of the identity of Egyptian, if it supports Egyptian identity, then it is kept within Egypt and probably moved to the museums of Cairo. Uh, but if not, then it becomes available to uh, the Western museums. Uh, and there is the additional enticement that is negotiated, that once these sites along the Lake Nasser, uh, the sites that are most threatened by the Aswan Dam Reservoir, once these sites are safeguarded and consolidated uh, and, and or abandoned, which is inevitable, um, then these, those nation states participating in this effort then have gained access to the artifacts held in the national treasury in Cairo. And so it's very enticing for international um, agencies. Um, here we see the blocks of the temples laid out uh, and labeled for their location, an extremely difficult and complicated technical achievement, um, and then reconstructed on higher ground um, here. Um, UNESCO becomes the key institution of the West in negotiating these uh, archaeological um, uh, ownership deals. And it's an interesting uh, study uh, in how the politics of international uh, superpower dynamics get negotiated through these uh, doctrines and institutions of heritage conservation. Um, and so we get many of these artifacts moving from their original location to new ones nearby, many more of them moving uh, downstream uh, to protected sites and museums, and then um, much of it, as you see up here, moving to New York, Leiden in the Netherlands, Madrid, Spain, Berlin, uh, and Turin, Italy. And so we see sites like this, the Temple of Dandur, um, photographed, measured, drawn, and moved. And it ends up uh, in Roch and Dinkaloo's uh, Egyptian wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, as the centerpiece of the Egyptian exhibition in New York City. Um, and this is repeated elsewhere um, with more or less archaeological attention. Um, but uh, one of the things we will discover as we move forward, as in back in time, is the importance of archaeology, that the archaeological record is increasingly unstable as we discover more and more things at a faster rate every day, uh, in part because of the ubiquity of satellite imagery. We discover things imprinted on the planet's surface that we never could see uh, previously from a lower vantage point. And so the discoveries are just stacking up. And uh, it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of what has yet to be unearthed. Uh, but in the meantime, dam projects happen. And here in Turkey, uh, named after Ataturk, who we'll look at uh, soon, here in Syria, along the Euphrates River, the cradle of civilization. Uh, and here we see um, Lake Assad. Uh, covering uh, much of this historic landscape of the first civilizations uh, that we'll get to in May. Um, and that brings us uh, to the final site of today's lecture, uh, which is in China. And it's a very interesting uh, coming together. It doesn't fall last chronologically 
but it's one of the more interesting sites because so many of these forces uh, ironically come together, uh, including the role of tourism and heritage conservation. And so, um, as you may be aware, um, the history of China, uh, all the dynasties that we have yet to uh, study in this course, um, and if you've seen the, the great movie, The, the Last Emperor, uh, it all comes to a halt uh, in the early 20th century, a uh, struggle for power, um, making a long, very long story short, uh, results in 1949, the triumph of uh, Mao Zedong and his leadership of uh, the Communist Party um, uh, seizes victory from the jaws of defeat by taking the long march, uh, uh, the heroic, very, very celebrated moment in uh, communist China's history. Um, uh, many people died, but it was, it was the, the move that uh, consolidated the power of the Red Army and forced um, uh, the Republican forces across the water to Taiwan. Um, and uh, there was a brief moment of very close relationships uh, between the Soviet Union and the newest member, uh, uh, potentially the greatest member of the communist world uh, in Red China, uh, as it was called at the time. And so the Soviet system of uh, very highly rationalized housing blocks in the modernist mode of workers' housing uh, related to factory production, the Soviet version of communism uh, under Stalin became very fixated on economic and industrial production. As a matter of fact, um, the breadbasket of uh, Eastern Europe was sucked dry through these co the collectivization of farms in this vast surplus production of one of the most productive landscapes on the planet uh, was reallocated towards industrial production. And so the agricultural production, the surpluses of agriculture, went to feed industry even as um, uh, millions of people starved to death. Um, and it was a very troubled, dark history. But the idea was to feed the industrial sector of the Soviet Union through a series of uh, five-year plans and put the USSR at the lead uh, of the superpower competition uh, and for a long time, it looked like it was inevitable. It looked like it was working brilliantly, especially when uh, they, the Soviets launched Sputnik. And they were first to put a satellite, first to put a dog, first to put a man in space. And uh, it really led to the wake-up call, um, one of several wake-up calls uh, that John F. Kennedy received uh, in the middle of the night. Hey, we are losing this battle. And as recently as uh, the 1990s, the, uh, the primary, the most popular economics textbook uh, of colleges and universities, maybe some of you uh, may have seen it, is by Samuelson. Even in the, that recent uh, edition uh, that was still being used in the 90s, of course in the 90s the, uh, everything had fallen apart, but uh, predicted the inevitability of um, a very strong Soviet Union, perhaps even surpassing uh, the economic status of the West because of this um, remarkable investment of resources and the willingness to sacrifice everything in the favor of industrial production. Now, I'm emphasizing this because it contrasts with the Chinese approach, where the Soviets were quite materialistic and economic in their approach, focusing on industry, um, especially under Stalin, uh, there was not a lot of nurturing of hearts and minds and bringing people along. That was what the gulag system was for. Uh, instead of appealing to people's hearts and minds, you appeal, you strike fear in the hearts of the population, uh, threatening imprisonment, execution, uh, or relocation to Siberia. China, in a way, was far more ideologically driven uh, version of communism. And uh, the early alliance between the Soviets and the Chinese uh, resulted 
in these remarkable factory complexes uh, under the name of the Donway system. Now, the Donway system is at the core of uh, this site, which is um, Joint Factory 798. It's called Joint Factory because it was a joint project between the Soviet Union, East Germany, and um, the Chinese. And it was a factory, uh, the communist China, they labeled their factories uh, three-digit numbers. Then any number starting with the number seven indicated that it was for defense purposes. And the reason we have access to this site now is it's become a very popular uh, arts community site. Has anyone been uh, to Chichangdi? I think I'm saying it right, in Beijing. Okay. Does anyone speak Mandarin? Is Chi Chang Di, am I saying it right? Is that what it is? It's three numbers. What? Uh, Chao Chang Di. 798? Is that, how do you say 798? <laughs> You'll have to help me. Um, so um, this, uh, you can see, or maybe you can't see, um, it's a factory complex that incorporates housing in the uh, mode of socialist uh, housing blocks, these slabs, and this centralized building, which is the center of life adjacent. And you can see in the, in the background uh, the smokestack of the factory. And so this was a walkable compound of uh, several thousand workers and their families where they are living, they are working, and they are recreating, and the recreation, the theme of the recreation is self-improvement and betterment and becoming mm -hmm. a better uh, member of Chinese uh, communist uh, march forward. And so the East German part of this uh, is one of the more interesting ones, it was the uh, industrial concrete architecture of these factory buildings. Um, that uh, maximized natural light, um, and it was a package deal um, sponsored by the Soviet Union with technical support from the technically uh, advanced uh, communities of East Germany uh, for the production of electronics. And at this point, electronics was the big game in town in the 1950s. Um, and the production of these materials... Um, looks so much better on my screen than on yours. Sorry about that. Um, but um, So the compound works together. And uh, what's interesting in uh, what the Soviet Union did was they focused on a few uh, urban settings where the factories could work very well. In China, there was very much an anti-urban approach. Whereas in the Soviet Union, in a way, it reproduced, uh, ironically, what the capitalist world had produced, which is this urban-centric society where wealth would accumulate in urban centers. The Soviet Union did that as well through the logic of, its, uh, of the Politburo system and the logic of industrial production. In China, uh, under Mao, they tried to reverse that. There was very much an anti-urban approach. They actually uh, suggested that every village have its own steel mill. And um, it never quite worked very well because of the quality of the steel that came out of these uh, backyard pig iron uh, furnaces. Uh, never quite uh, took off. But it was that spirit that it was a decentralized instinct. And... Um, it was very much at the heart of the first five-year plan was the creation of these Donway uh, communities um, that uh, centered around the consolidation of life under communism where uh, these communities of people that lived together, worked together, ate together, um, viewed movies together, uh, their children were schooled together, and so it was a a totally integrated um, community. Um, here we see the tourist map because of what it later became. Um, but this is a diagram of the kind of spatial arrangement 
of the downway system. And so you have the, the housing blocks very much based on the Soviet system of housing uh, coming out of uh, Stalin's uh, Soviet um, re reproduction of the industrial uh, society. Um, the school, the clinic, the dining facilities, uh, the factory where the work takes place, and the uh, main administrative building that became kind of the symbolic um, central focal point. Uh, and so, whereas we might want to lavish a great deal of attention on that, uh, in this course we're actually looking at the larger system of relationship between the different elements of the built environment that all supposedly contributed to the success of the Donway system. Now, in the bringing of the Soviet model almost verbatim from the north down into China, there was a very strong mismatch that in later uh, subsequent waves of the five-year plan, um, there was a great effort by Chinese architects to, uh, to adapt and make it culturally appropriate. And, uh, and inadvertently, even though it was against the rhetoric, uh, the most idealist, idealistic rhetoric, of communism to refer to historical forces. Remember, we are eliminating the past. It's a great purge of the past. And the, the dark side of Chinese history uh, is these episodic spasms of purging um, that have been made famous uh, in film um, in multiple ways. But this connection uh, was inevitable between the family courtyard and the extended family structure of the Chinese uh, traditions to the Don Wei, and there seemed to be a resonance there where instead of your ancestral extended family, it was your family of workers, and you take care of each other, and um, you watch out for deviant behaviors uh, within each other um, as well. Um, and so here's um, a Don Wei dining hall. I think you can probably see um, Yang Mao uh, overlooking the scene. Um, and all of this is done uh, every moment of every day, including the physical structure. Uh, there's a famous quote by um, Henri Lefebvre, um, <clears throat> who could be a patron saint of this approach to uh, this course, uh, who talked about no revolution uh, is worthy of the name if it doesn't transform the spatial uh, arrangement of everyday life. Uh, of its people. And that was very much at the heart of both the Soviet and the, um, the communist China approach um, that um, is very clear in what they are trying to do. Architectural uh, arrangements are at the core of the total transformation of society. And we don't hear much about the Don Wei uh, because we hear more about things like this, uh, and we still see them when we go to China, uh, we see um, the monumental constructions. And the history of architecture favors uh, typically the monumental constructions of architectural history. But uh, many have argued that a much bigger significance should be given to uh, the distributed, dispersed, um, a Don Wei system that transformed every town and village and every part of the city uh, during, especially during the early years in the 50s. Um, in 1959, as part of, uh, or just after the Great Leap Forward, uh, there was a dramatic push in a very short period of time, in 10 months, to build 10 buildings um, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of uh, the Communist Revolution. Uh, in three styles, and um, one of them was a vernacular Chinese style, if you know the Beijing Rail Station. That was a modern building, but um, in the decorated shed uh, mode that we saw in Las Vegas, very much festooned with uh, references to vernacular uh, traditional Chinese uh, form. Here we see, um, more importantly for this topic, um, on two sides of Tiananmen Square, um, two prominent buildings that uh, reflect this relationship between the Soviet Union and uh, China at this time in its architectural forms. Uh, which brings us to uh, another chapter in the role of uh, 
power and space, Tiananmen Square attracted uh, the attention of the protesters in 1989, um, which then also required the strong response of the state military forces. And, and this is um, a, a reference back to um, Lenin's body and the importance of the human body in space. Here we see this remarkable demonstration that the human body in space still has power. Um, Um, then just to complete the historical story, we move uh, forward, 1989, the uh, dramatic and for many uh, surprise and sudden disillusion of uh, the Soviet Union um, into uh, multiple, return to its multiple state status. Uh, and in 1989, the same year as Tiananmen Square, um, and then... Um, 1989 was also a very important year uh, when Deng Xiaoping, who uh, inherited leadership uh, in China, emerges uh, forcefully uh, first uh, uh, in 79 with the open door policy, and then uh, in the 80s uh, we see the transformation of Shanghai, uh, Lu Zhua Sui, the financial district in Pudong that we've uh, looked at previously, and here we see the opening up of uh, China for tourism, uh, and it becomes safe for uh, the bourgeois uh, activities of artists and art galleries. And this is the transformation of Joint Factory 798 um, in the, uh, into an artist community uh, under the guidance of the internationally uh, famous artist Ai Weiwei. Have we heard of Ai Weiwei? Yes. Um, who, uh, who has a home and studio in the neighborhood and has uh, been a part of this uh, transformation, uh, in part celebrating the legacy of this, um, this facility as a Donway community, ironically becoming the home base for some of the most um, extravagant uh, vestiges of the capitalist world, um, uh, but still uh, maintaining in the container of architecture, which uh, leaves us with one final uh, message very clearly that even as we attempt to associate specific meanings to specific architectural forms, uh, time and time again, uh, architectural history corrects that impression. And they demonstrate repeatedly uh, the slippage that can occur between form and meaning. Thus, we see throughout this topic um, the origins of abstract art in um, this new human spirit, uh, uh, even socialist, uh, Marxist, communist meanings, that the, the glass and steel box uh, that began as a, a soaring human spirit um, associated with socialist housing was later became uh, the icon, uh, the central symbolic icon of uh, U.S. capitalism and multinational corporations, uh, we see a similar slippage here, where the workers' factory becomes the container um, demonstrating how flexible architecture, uh, architectural meanings can flow um, along with the activities that are associated with them. So are there Questions about anything? We have uh, no more time. So thank you.